Okay, um, hello everyone. I'm Robert Wimmer from the Part-Time Scientist. And we are doing four short presentations here. First of all, I want to give you a short introduction in what the Google Lunar X Prize is and what we as a team want to achieve in this regard. This is more or less a non-technical uh, presentation, the first part. The second part will be totally based around our Lunar Rover prototype, the current development model for 2009, which will be revealed live on stage by Michael and Jürgen. The third part will be featuring our board computing unit. Yeah, simply call it this way. And the fourth part, the, the last part, is something which was quite a secret right now, which will be revealed today. Some real, very cool new way to do deep space communications in future. So this is the last part of it. <laughs> okay, uh, so first I have to say we are no professionals by any means in regards of presentation, so please bear with us a little bit and let's see how this works out, okay? Um, okay, <laughs> just start. Um, <clears throat> So, first of all, what is the Google Lunar X Prize? Before I start with the Google Lunar X Prize, let us say what is the X Prize anyway? Because X Prize is just a word. In the history, if you look back at it, an X Prize itself is just a prize set out to achieve something that is uh, really far away, that hasn't been done by anyone so far, and where there is for mostly economic no reason to do it right now. So, one example in history of this is the spirit of St. Louis. So, if you know Charles Lindbergh, you can see him here, um, flew an airplane from um, America to France about 1920 and successfully, um, he successfully did it and this was in regards of a competition. Set out to get, win a $10,000 prize money. $10,000 isn't quite much in nowadays dimension but back then it was quite a lot of money and this prize money was set out by one single individual just to show, see if something like this could be possible. This prize money um, really put out a development where people tried to see how can I build an airplane to cross the, um, the distance from America to Europe. So, okay, take this to our times. One very recent example of um, our times. Huh? is the Anzeri X Prize. The Anzeri X Prize was set up by the X Prize Foundation, which is a non-profit organization based in the US, in, back in 2004. The goal was to build a, a space, suborbital spaceship which is um, capable of doing a reusable re-entry in the Earth's atmosphere. So, meaning you have to get about higher than 100 kilometers about Earth's ground and you have to do it two times in less than 14 days without exchanging more than 10% of the parts you used in the first try. May sound a bit complicated, but the idea behind this is that you don't use uh, throwaway space chips like most of the rocket engines we nowadays use. And this competition was, competition was won pretty fast, as, I, as one can say, by um, with Spaceship One craft. This is the first non-government manned spacecraft in 2004. So, this was the first X Prize that really kicked off a long history of X Prizes that followed. Right now there are about three active X Prizes. One about uh, uh, human genome, um, automotive industry, so building more efficient cars, and the X Prize we participate in, the Google Lunar X Prize. To give you an idea what the Google Lunar X Prize is in the state right now, the Google Lunar X Prize is going on for two years right now. And after two years, we have 21 teams from over 12 nations participating. So, okay, you may say, yeah, okay, let's put up together a team to create a mission to the moon. So why not? But the point is, you can't simply um, say you uh, want to make a want to set up a team to participate in the Google X Prize. You have to present a complete concept and you have to prove that, uh, let's uh, put it in uh, more fine words, and tot not totally nuts. So you have to prove that you're um, professional enough to uh, at least have a chance to achieve it. So all the countries you can see highlighted in white are countries where teams have um, already formed to participate in the Google X Prize. One great thing about the Google X Prize is, says, 
Normally, all prices, NAS, NASA, does a lot of um, prices, like the Northrop Gruner Lander Challenge, where you uh, have to build a lunar lander module, which can lands on the Earth's surface and starts again, and so on. These prices are a lot only based for, uh, only for persons who live in the USA. This has something to do with uh, laws and regulations over in the US, where you can use uh, US tax money only for persons that are ba living in the US itself. So if the, um, NASA would set out the Google Lunar X Prize, so it would be the NASA Lunar X Prize, uh, no German or any other team then coming from America could participate in it. So the Google Lunar X Prize is really something extraordinary because teams from all parts of the world can take part in it. Okay, so, so what is so special about the Google Lunar X Prize? So if you take a look at this picture, it's pretty much well known to everyone. It's a so-called Earthrise picture. It's a picture taken from the moon where you can see the Earth rising up. So one thing that this picture doesn't show to you is one important thing, it's the distance between Earth and moon. It's more than 400,000 kilometers. And it's, if you want to get to the moon, it's not just a straight line. We have to do a lot of uh, trajectory calculations to find your way with an um, uh, aircraft, a uh, spacecraft from Earth to the moon. I will show you more details about this later. This is just an introduction part. So it's a little bit out of range here. So, okay. Just show you something about the topics that the Google Lunar X Prize has and the prize money about it. <laughs> ah. Poor Mario. Okay, so we have a grand prize where you have to, with uh, 20 million US dollars, for 20 million US dollars, you have to build a spacecraft. No, not spacecraft. You have to build a rover, send it to the moon, and the rover has to travel 500 meters on the lunar surface and transmit a so-called mooncast data package back to Earth. Mooncast itself may sound a pretty much web 2.0, but it really is something pretty cool idea behind this because the mooncast says you have to transmit real-time HD 720p video signal back to Earth. So. Think about it a little bit. We have 400,000 kilometers on one side on distance, and we have real-time HD video streaming signals, and we have something that you don't know about it, but we will come to that later. We have the fact that the technology we can use in space due to radiation is not the same that you can use right now when you go to, let's say, Media Markt and buy a new laptop. So it's not that powerful. So we don't have simply have the capability right now to do HD real-time video encoding. But we'll show, you to do, we'll show you some way to do this. So, what about the uh, second and third prize? Uh, the second prize is the Heritage Prize. The Heritage Prize is about shooting a picture of a so-called site of interest. To say it more easily, you have to shoot a picture of the Apollo landing site. So you have to prove that you were there, shoot a photo, and if you do so, you get four million US dollars. So. I think every one of you know. Uh, every one of you know why they set out a four million prize to get a picture from the Apollo landing site. <laughs> okay, so we have got another prize, but I don't think this prize will be there much longer because it is the water detection bonus prize. And after the latest L cross results, I think this prize will, let's say, at least get a little bit smaller prize because right now we get four million US dollars to prove the existence of water on the moon, but. The last Air Cross mission of NASA already did it, so I'm not sure how this evolves. And there's one thing to note about it in scientific regards. If you want to prove water ice on the moon, you have to go for one, uh, from one of the, uh, the South Pole, for example. Nearly, nearly all moon missions, uh, lunar missions right now, we are going for ir equatorial reasons. This has something to do with the landing trajectory and the surface. The surface on the moon is pretty much cluttered, so you have gaps of the size of 15 meters. So if you've got a rover, with a, uh, a rover with a length of, let's say, one meter, and you have a gap like 15 meters, so you have simply no way to go around it. And in equatorial regions, you don't have this problem. You have very fine regolith sand. It's almost all one flat place. And at the pole region, you have uh, every meter craters and a harsh environment, so it's pretty much hard to travel on the South Pole. So and then if you have the range bonus prize. The range bonus prize is simply an addition. You have to travel five kilometer instead of 500 meter. 
I think the range bonus price is something simply a pretty good idea, which shows the good concept of the X price because there are many teams, as I said before, 21 teams, and there are simply teams that are building rovers which can travel 500 meters and instantly fall apart. <laughs> it's something they will build with rocket engines, so they have a, a fuel deposit, and if this fuel deposit gets burned out, the rover is uh, stood still. So it's not a very intelligent design, as I think. It's only made up to win this competition, but it doesn't help the world in any technological reason. What we try to achieve is always to get an advantage for everyone out of this. But we will come to that later. Um, okay, so then there's the survival prize. It's something I really like about this. The survival prize, you have to survive 14.5 uh, days on the lunar surface over a lunar night. The lunar night and the lunar day have quite a lot of difference because we have, on the lunar day you have plus 160 degrees and at the lunar night we have minus 160 degrees. So, and the uh, shape over time vector, I have, don't have a graphic in this but um, I could show you afterwards. Uh, there's a graphic I have um, created so you could see that they have only about, let's say, two hours where these two extreme differences collide together. Normally, every hardware you have right now, for example, this laptop would immediately be break apart because of the extreme temperature differences. But just push and back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. And the last but, li but not least is the diversity bonus prize. Diversity bonus prize is something they set up to uh, encourage teams to take people uh, to don't just uh, make German-based teams. I heard of teams who just for locals, like um, people from California or something like this. This is something I really don't like because right now we're living in a world where we have the internet and everyone's connected with everyone. Why should everyone not be allowed to work together in a team like this? That's why the Diversity Prize encourage teams to invite people like them. For example, our team has team members all across the globe. I will show you a slide regarding this later on. So, not just local-based teams. <coughs> Okay, let's sum up the complicated things about the X-Pies. It's, it's just an easy summarization. So first you have to get to the moon. Getting to the moon, I will show you how we do this at the end of this uh, presentation slide. Then secondly, huh? okay, uh, second, this relative complicated part, <coughs> you have to do a soft landing on the lunar surface. Um, soft landing on the lunar surface, it's not like you see on many videos from Mars landings or science fiction movies. Um, the lunar surface has no atmosphere. I saw teams proposing to use airbags to land on the moon. It's hmm? I was trying to call you. Oh. Yeah, ah. You might want to hang up or, or just tell him you're busy or something. Is, no, no, no problem. I, I think I will call him back later. He knows the time when he's uh, due. Okay, okay. cool. Just, just thought you should know. Oh. Our special guest has been revealed, sorry. <coughs> okay, um, okay, soft landing, hard part. Next one, communication. Communication, as I said before, we have a special presentation at this at the end. So, I just leave out the details, but it's very, yeah, it's okay. I'm not accepting right now because it's take too long to explain to him that we can do this in 30 minutes when it's due. Um, <coughs> okay, and the survival of the lunar night. The survival of the lunar night, as I said before, is not just about temperature. Uh, the intention for this picture was something like um, everything's better with bacon. <laughs> Okay, um, one thing I want to say in regards of this, um, you don't have to adjust the temperature, you have the radiation. But the radiation, Arne will give you um, some uh, details about this, what the radiation means for your computers or your iPhone, whatever you have, and some nice pictures of this later on. Okay, so just see what slide I got next. Um, this is just a trans transition over to the next section. I'm really into animations. <coughs> okay, so let's talk about budgets. This is a topic I really like because we've got NASA. So everyone knows NASA back from the 60s. 
So does everyone know what budget they had back in the 60s? Let's take a look at this number. It's 90 billion 870 million current euros, uh, yeah, euro. I translated it to the current unit euro because US dollars uh, number would be quite longer. <laughs> okay, and if you look at this number, it's, it's simply incredible. You can't say anything about it. But uh, they had to develop a whole lot of new technology back in the 60s, so we're taking this into credit. Just compared to nowadays moon missions. So the, uh, one of the latest moon missions we had was the Chandrayaan moon missions set out by India. They used a lot of components available on the free market, so just not just bought, but they just bought components like um, rocket engines and so on. And so they got to the relatively small price of 40, no, 64 million euros. Then there was the, oh, so this was only um, orbiting missions, not just landing on the surface, just, just getting to the moon, orbiting, taking pictures and crashing down sometime. Okay, and then we had the Elkhorst mission, which was quite successfully in the last two months, and it was about 53 million euro. And let's compare this to the uh, Google Lunar X price. So you see, you get a price money of 20 million euro, and even the cheapest moon mission we had so far, and moon missions who buy all of the shelf technology, required certain, a lot of more money to do this. So, just for one before I start talking about this, this is what we have in mind for our moon mission. It's not just a number I'm showing up, it's just our planning schedule. We are not going to exceed any more than this amount of money. This has something to do with the things I will show you in the next slides. So, okay. It's quite an easy summation. Okay, first of all, we are not going to build any kind of rocket or rocket engine. So we are not totally nuts and going into our skets and pulling together rocket fuel and blowing us up. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's something you can't do something like this. You have to say it. And NASA it took NASA 10 years to build a rocket that's not going to explode just to lift up. I have to say it. They had exploding rockets every week at their testing ground. So it's not easy. And you can't say, okay, I'm going to build a rocket. No way. So you have to buy one. So. Actually, there is um, something new development in this regard. So most of you, I don't know if you know about it, there is a space provider, it's called SpaceX. A space provider, sorry. <laughs> <There's a laughs> um, they're providing you the capability to get payloads to low Earth orbit using uh, self-built rocket engines, and they're quite good at it. They have the Falcon series, but we save some pictures on it later, so just spare this one. Okay, the second part, as I said before, our approach is to using much as possible existing technology. So you see in the upcoming slides, we are not reinventing anything. Okay, just skip to the next one. So, and one important thing, it's a low budget. Why I'm saying this? Low budget always are try to be bad things, low budgets. Because they are limiting you, you can't do this because you don't have money for this. Think about the following. If you have a lot of money lying around and you say, okay, this is your budget, it's about one billion, let's say US dollars. What can you do with it? Hmm, why not? Let's waste some millions on some studies and look at this and another millions goes by. Um, there are a lot of studies happening just to see, could it be possible to do this or this? And this study just costs some millions. I don't want to make any special, I can talk about this topic afterwards because I have some examples for this, but I don't want to blame anyone right now. But there are simply um, not useful studies going on. And they're taking a lot of money, and if you take this money, you could simply finance a moon mission by itself immediately. So, okay, so using having a low budget means you don't waste money. That's what I want to say with it. So innovation, innovation is something everyone says right now, nowadays. It just means that we try to use most of high technology as possible. As again, you will see this later on, so we are not using technologies back from 1995, uh, so. Okay. And, ah, Jack again. Okay, no, uh, no time. So this is applying right now too. No time just means um, the first deadline for the Google Lunar X Prize is the, um, the end of 2012. It's not the end of the world, it's just the end of 2012. 
So at the end of 2012, the X price, price money fee will be uh, reduced by, I think, about 10 million. So you really have all teams are encouraged to reach the moon and all uh, goals associated with it before 2012. This is really a short time frame if you think about it. NASA and other agencies took about 10 or 8 years to plan a sun mission like this. I know that uh, DLR had planned the mission about 5 or 6 years and it didn't even happen. So just planning, you can spend a lot of time with it. And last but not least, I'm just writing we are not reinventing the cow. Why I'm saying not reinventing the cow? Normally you would say we are not reinventing the wheel, but we are reinventing the wheel. You will see this in Michael's presentation. Okay. Okay, so just one thing about us. Currently our team consists of 33 people with uh, all, from all nations, from all professions. Just to give you a quick overview. We have engineers, we have aerospace professionals, students, broadcast engineers, retired military staff, we have economists, yeah, you need them too. <laughs> we have IT professionals, obviously, like me. And we have technical programmers, you need a lot of them. And what is really great, and this is where Jack Crenshaw, our special guest, comes in, we have uh, some members from the retired Apollo staff, which are really great guys to work with, I have to say this. And they really have fun working on this again, because they did it 40 years ago. Okay, and last but not least, we have our partners, sponsors, and so on. Okay, and maybe you. So we are always interested into getting new members. So if you maybe have something special skills, because we have always looking for special skill sets, just talk to us uh, after the presentation. We're having uh, okay. I should say that we have uh, preparing a booth outside, on the right hand side of this room, on the outer side, to where you can see all the technology. I brought some special boards and so on with us, so you can see, touch it, and so on, yeah. And there are some things for free um, giveaways from our partners and from us. Okay, this is something I want to skip through very fast, so I want to have created a timeline where you can see all the first ever, first time events happening in regards of space exploration. You will see, quickly see what I mean. The first uh, satellite ever, so we have a uh, lunar impactor and so on. I will just skip to Sue because the intention of this timeline is not just to show any single event by itself. It's because to show you that the events are decreasing, not increasing. We have a relatively high increase to the 80s and starting with the 90s, we will see it's rapidly going downwards. So space exploration, I'm not going to say it's falling asleep, but it really isn't that interesting anymore like what's in the 60s or 70s. So there was a lot of things, very interesting things happening in the 70s and uh, 80s, like the first space station and so on. Oops, okay. Yeah, this was the launch of the Columbia, okay. Ah. It's a bit quick right now, but I'm you can see the slides afterwards, so you can look at the pictures, anyone individual. It's just because I haven't much time planned in for this, we could talk half an hour about just about all these events. Okay. So, and now we are in the 90s. So you see we get the Hubble telescope, and then we are in 2000. So, no first event besides Hubble in between. Okay, you would say sometimes all first events are gone and you have to do normal stuff, but uh, not having any special thing like being the first one, uh, first rover on Venus or something like Russia had means that you are simply stuck. You don't have doing any research or you're simply not doing any progress. Maybe you are doing a lot of research, but you're not trying something. You're sitting at home and planning about it. So this guy is really great. <laughs> it's Dennis Tito. It's the first private space tourist. The part that he um, took was something that really kicked off some very interesting because people, after him, people uh, into, uh, tend to be more interested in regards of space because they say, hey, okay, private person getting into space, maybe I could do it too. Um, if you see here, China started its space program and they're pretty much advanced right now. And as again, 2004, we have Spaceship One, the first private spaceship. So as you see, after 2000, private people 
are getting their share of space exploration. So, and there should be only one additional mission. Ah, it's Cassini, okay. And that should be it. Yes, it was. Okay, now come to the last part. It's a little bit more technical. And then we come to the rover part. So, again, with some very interesting animations. <laughs> I have to say, I got regarding this animation system, it's a self developed uh, 3D OpenGL based rendering software. <laughs> we. <laughs> Yeah, there could be there many reasons why we have uh, wrote it, but I have to, we simply have to say that normal slideshow presentation softwares are simply too lame. You have to, <laughs> if you have a lot of pictures on your slides, you have big files and so on, and you can't do it. Uh, with this software, you can simply use vector graphics or TIFF files and just animate them any way you want with the effects. So it's quite interesting. Okay, back to our work. Now we're talking a bit more technical details. As I'm a person, I favor technical details. So. Okay, so we have a picture of the Falcon 1E rocket. The Falcon 1E is, as I said before, a rocket developed by the SpaceX. So, what our team tries to use as our carrier device, not to the moon, I have to say this, not to the moon, uh, because they have um, direct and indirect uh, transactions to get to the moon. Um, we want to get to the low Earth orbit first, and from the low Earth orbit with a second engine to the moon. This is, may sound more complicated than uh, having a a rocket which gets you to the moon direct way, but it's a lot of, uh, better, but it's a little bit more complicated to explain. Maybe I'm not sure, not sure about it if Jack tells a little bit about this, because this involves a lot of delta V factors and mathematics in this regard. Okay, one thing we really want to achieve, and we are currently having, um, working together with SpaceX in this regard, um, if you read Wikipedia or something like this, you will see, always see a number like um, if you want to send something to low Earth orbit, you have to pay $10,000 per kilogram. It's quite a normal number. It's always, everyone says it. Um, we've developed uh, um, some modifications where we want to get below this number. This really helps you because if you think $10,000 per kilogram, um, I want to do some things first. Um, as our, our rover will be presented, we'll only have about five kilogram and it would be $50,000 just to get it to the low Earth orbit, not considering all the fuel you need to be there. So getting below this really helps to get more people to shoot something in this direction. Okay, and this is just for info, we have about 1,010 kilograms of mass to low Earth orbit currently. This intakes about 80% of fuel. This is something quite special because normal missions are packed full of electronics and experiments and get a little bit less fuel. And what you have end up is something like Elkhorst. You have a mission with a relatively short li lifetime. Okay, maybe you fulfill all your requirements in this short lifetime, but you can't do anything later on. So, for, exa for example, uh, if, you fuel, if you run out of fuel, your craft will simply crash on the surface. So, there's nothing you can do with it any longer and you have, can't get uh, any backup fuel or so. So planning into a lot of fuel reserves really extends your mission lifetime. So you can do more things, let me say, five years after you finished your mission. Okay, the lunar lander is something that is quite a secret right now, but one thing that are currently public is the mass of 300 kilogram. And one very important thing, um, our lunar lander tries to do the same as Russia did before. We want to uh, do an automatic sample return mission. So. As I said before, the lander will do a soft landing on the lunar surface, and after this, uh, the rover will depart from the lander, and then the uh, landing part will take a surface probe and will restart again in a relatively short time window. Why the same time window? Because if it, uh, it's standing still too long, it's cooling out, and you can't get back the engine on. So you have a relatively short time frame to get your sample, get it into the lander, and start the engine up again. So, and you read the, to, to the low gravity of the moon, it's relatively easy to get back to Earth. And we've already talked to the agents, agencies necessary. They provided us with an option to do our sample recovery. So, we get a surface probe back and get a recovery of this probe for free. 
Okay, so we have to give some share of the probes, but it's some really cool if you consider the price you have to pay for a sample of Rigolith. Um, okay. So the rover itself, I just skipped this one because all the details will be presented by Michael and Jürgen. And some point in guts of the MCU, because Arne shares his part with Jack, and I don't know how long this will take, uh, Jack part, so I'm taking some information beforehand. Our board computing unit is based on an FPGA. Um, if you don't know what an FPGA is, just wait a second and um, Arne will explain it later. Uh, it's, it's a specialized Xilinx Vertex 4 FPGA, which is doing all analog and digital control. It's uh, something means like you have one chip doing all the work, so you don't have a thousand components around it like you have nowadays on certain main boards. And this really minimizes the error counter, and you can do a lot of more things that you will see in the last and the following presentation. And this is the important part. Everything of our component is high wheel certified. High wheel certified, what does high wheel mean? Arne will give you an information about this. But this means that these components can withstand exp uh, exposure to space. Just in a brief introduction. Because as I said before, your normal handy or iPhone simply would fall apart not uh, just to temperature, but to radiation and vacuum. Okay, one important thing I'm really a fan of is standardized protocols. So what does this mean? Uh, if you think about 20 years ago, you've got a rocket here, you've got an engine there, and you've got some thrusters there, and they all got different wirings, uh, different protocols, control engines, proto um, yeah, control units, and so on. And you don't have to, let's say, uh, at least uh, order have 50 employees just writing up all the control mechanisms to coordinate all this different equipment. Uh, nowadays, um, vendors set for standardized protocols, so new rockets and engines have, for example, Ethernet as bus system. It's something pretty cool, so you can use Ethernet in your main control unit to connect it and control the engines and all the trust <coughs> and behavior. Okay, and one very interesting thing is we have built a persistent high wheel data storage, which is something quite special because there's not much where you can store data in space due to radiation. Okay, but I'm just leave this to Arne. Hence this ECC algorithm, I would have uh, liked to talk about this in this presentation, but it, uh, it really is too complicated and so I leave it out. But uh, you can talk about, uh, we have a special implementation in this regard, so we can maybe see it in one year on Wikipedia or so. Okay, so this almost was it. Just one last slide and we can go to the rover. The last slide is something for me pretty important because, no? okay, and just a summarization of our current partners. We have a lot of public and non-public partners. Um, yeah, we'll just name it from one side to one side. We have Texas Instruments, we have CatSoft, which are producing the software maybe most of you know as Eagle. Uh, we have Maxon Motor, SolidWorks, then we have uh, the SolidLine AG, then we have Schneider Kreuznach, MindMeister, and very important, Silings, and what I really like is O'Reilly. The folks at O'Reilly are absolutely great, I have to say this. Not just the books, but the folks too, absolutely. Okay, this is one, what, one my first part. Der Funkempfang ist manchmal nicht da, da muss ein Tick rüber gehen. Okay. Hello, my name is Michael and I will tell you something about the stages of our rover development. Uh, we will talk about, about the requirements we need for, to build a rover. Uh, Jürgen will tell about uh, the concepts, uh, the rover we have, especially uh, the mass. We will uh, show you something hardware uh, we built in the last year. I will show you some pictures of the technology we use in our rover, and uh, we will take a few, um, a short view in the future uh, of our rover development. Requirements. First requirements uh, 
as Robert said, will be set by the uh, Google Luna X Prize. 500 meters driving and uh, Mooncast. Mooncast, uh, uh, remember, was sending text files, uh, uh, sending a live stream, and so on. We have uh, requirements we set and ourselves. That means 5,000 meters driving and surviving the lunar night. But all of these requirements um, have to face the moon. The moon sets his own requirements, and the first and most important is temperature. We have minus 160 degrees at night and plus 160 degrees at day. And uh, to find material that handle these temperatures is not so easy as it seems. The surface itself, uh, we have no maps about the, uh, the surface uh, you can use to uh, set a road map for the rover. The rover had to find its own way and had, it had to go it alone. And a really bad thing is regolith. The most part of the surface of the moon is uh, covered in regolith, and regolith is a very, very bad thing. It's, it's very abrasive, and uh, th there's a story that the Apollo astronauts have black hands from it. It came into their spacesuits, and, uh, and so have we uh, to make sure that our electronics, our bearings, have really good sealed to save it for regolit. <laughs> Jürgen will say something about uh, the components of the rover and their mass, so you can see how we planned uh, Yeah, thanks to you, thanks to you, Michael. Uh, it's also from my side a hello to the audience. As a mechanical engineer, I never thought to speak on the CCC. It's a great, great pleasure for me. But now let's have a look on the side behind me. Um, on this side, we will list uh, the final components of our rover and their plant mass. Let's start with the first point, is the mobility. The rover is equipped with four 360 degrees turnable wheels. Each wheel has one motor for traction and one motor for steering. To further enhance the mobility, each wheel is suspended by an independent passive wheel suspension and the mass where one wheel include the, the traction motor won't exceed 250 gram, so one kilogram total for all four wheels. And the second point, there is the tower. The final version will have a turnable and tiltable camera tower. By design, this rover we will present you today doesn't have a camera tower. This has two reasons. Firstly, uh, the main purpose for the prototype are the driving tests and also the tests of the electronics. And secondly, we have decided on one particular camera model yet. The size of the camera plays a considerable role uh, in the design of such a tower, but um, the total mass of the tower shall not exceed one kilogram. Then we, we have the control. The main computing unit, or MCU, makes up the entire electronic component of the rover. Its mass include the tank holding it, 
uh, shall not exceed 500 gram. Then the energy, uh, we have a solar panel and the built-in phased array antenna of the uh, final rover. We have add another 500 gram into the equation. And then there is a point reserved, one of the tasks defined by the X-Prize Foundation include an additional payload. The mass will be somewhere between 100 and 50 hundred gram. Yeah, and last but not least, and as I see it's not on the slide, all the parts are held together by a rocket frame made of, uh, finally made of aluminium and carbon. The frame is the most important static element of the rover. A mass of one kilogram is achieved. So our, our mass goal for the rover is now encompassed. Back to Michel. So, a little bit away from this uh, theory, Let's show some video of building a rover. Do I tip him? Yeah. Okay. Tip him up. Hmm? Ah. Ah. It's just a placeholder, but it's important. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's switch to the video. Okay, let's see if we have sound in this. I'm not sure about it. Here for real, our first prototype of a moon rover. So, let's take uh, some look of of the details. So. We have here the, st uh, the steering motors inside the frame, the traction motors inside the wheel. You can see here the frame. It holds everything on the rover. Here, this is uh, a case for the electronics. The frame, again, the wheels before uh, build 
vor, äh, was heißt montiert? <lacht> Montage, vor der Montage. <lacht> okay. The solar panel is uh, just a mock-up uh, right now, uh, but we change that uh, in the next half year. Um, Arne will say uh, in his presentation uh, something more about the technology in the solar panel. And the optics, we haven't decided optics yet, yet but uh, Schneider Kreuznach uh, seems a big favorite for us. The optics, uh, you see here is uh, Hyrule certified and uh, you was used on the ISS space station um, and uh, it's very, very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so, what up next year? New materials. We have to uh, look for new materials to uh, reduce the mass for scientific payload and uh, the idea was to use carbon fiber reinforced polymer <laughs> CFK <laughs> uh, a new design for the tower and the, uh, the frame all that can you see on our homepage and Twitter and the blog and uh, if you have any questions today, uh, we are standing outside at the, at the booth and uh, I will be there and will answer. <laughs> Arne will tell you something about the MCU. Today I would like to talk about our electronics, especially the main computing unit. First we have the requirements from the Google Luna X Prize, for example transmitting the HD video. The main problem is we need a lot of processing power, but also we are limited in selecting the parts. Not all are space compatible. So, yeah. yeah, we need also a flexible design. For example, we can't change the hardware every time. So, we decided uh, to use um, a bit, uh, FPDA. The condition is that it has to be high risk certified so it will work also in space. One uh, lifetime has, has two definitions. One is it has to live long enough on the moon. The other is we have it would be nice to reuse the design for later missions. So keep it simple and stupid. So don't add too much parts, not external video compression chips. So. Yeah. What is high real? That means first we have extended temperature ranges. The so standard High real chips are from minus 55 to 125 degrees. That is still not enough for the moon, but it's the best you can buy here. <laughs> so it means we have to test these parts if I can withstand the minus 160 degrees or at least the 122. Or, and for the worst case, the 160 degrees. There's also the radiation. High real components are tested against radiation. Oh. For example, we have yeah, the single upset, single event effects that are electrons or protons with a high speed that hits the ship. 
and yeah, in worst case, it's end with a burnt out effect. Whereas also the total ionizing dose, that means each event damage the ship a little bit and if the total dose is reached, the ship will fail too. <laughs> So, yeah. so currently we are working on the first prototype board. It is equipped with a Vertex 4 FX20 FVGA. It's a small one. It's not the final one. It's not space compatible. But it's enough for testing a few things. For example, we have a DDR. RAM with 80 bit instead 64 or 75 too. That means we can test other error correction algorithms, for example, extend it to up to three bits of 64 that can be corrected. But there are limitations. So there's another algorithm that could correct to various bits of the 64. Or a third configuration that allows to compensate one ship failure so that uh, nine remaining ships will work like a standard ECC module. We have also a five channel NAND flash interface. They should work in the RAID 3 mode. That means we can also compensate a ship failure of one. So uh, for testing external hardware like cameras or motors, we have a VHDCI connector from SCSI, but we're using it for, as GPIO for the 64 lines. And we have also two pin headers with 16 lines each, that can be used for hardware. Also, it's, there are two Ethernet that was not easy to get them. <laughs> we can use them for debugging or using the board as router. <laughs> so, to, to not waste the possibilities, we connect the giga, multi gigabit transceiver to a few SATA ports. So. So let's have a look inside the FPGA. We have a PowerPC 405 core. It's a hard core, so it's real in silicon. We don't have to use the FPGA logic to build it. We have also two Ethernet Emacs, so we are, they are connected to the Ethernet first. When we have our DDR2 RAM, it's a multi-port memory controller. That is an IP core that is implemented with the FPGA logic. And yeah, it's uh, connected to the PowerPC connector with two processor local buses. When we have also a few more query fields, for example, the block RAM that contains the bootloader and UART that is connected to an S232 interface, an interrupt controller, an inter EC controller for external sensors, for example, current or temperature, or maybe it's a real time clock. So, that is all things when you, that is provided by Silings. But now we have the components we have to develop ourselves. For example, the motor controller. So, the last part I want to talk about today is our concept for the antenna and the solar panel. A solar panel has a conflict with the antenna 
they require the same space. They are both large objects compared to the other components on the rover. So our only solution is embed the antennas into the solar panel. Maybe a few people here have heard from slotted array antennas. Some people use them for wireless LAN. So it's possible to embed the slots into the solar cell to yeah, implement a high gain antenna. <laughs> so. yeah, we have two antennas in embedded. One is an X band antenna for transmitting. It, has, it requires a high bandwidth for, for example, to transmit the HD video. And a low bandwidth antenna for receiving the comments. The data rate is not more than a serial line. So. No? Yeah, I would like to give back to Roba. Okay, so let's see if uh, Jack Quencher is angry at us because we not answered his phone calls. <laughs> okay, um, now I'm going to call Jack Quencher, just to give you a short introduction about him. Uh, Jack Quencher, uh, um, you probably most know him because of uh, he published a really, really long list of articles in regards of embedded hardware development. He was on the Lunar Trajectory Group back in 1960, working on the original, completely entire Apollo program, and he did the lunar trajectory calculations there. So and he's, that's when, uh, one of the oldest geeks I know, absolutely. <laughs> and he's pretty cool, and yeah, okay. So let's see if he talks to us. Okay, okay. <coughs> yeah, it's quite a long list. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Um, okay, um, first of all, um, he will uh, tell something about himself and what he's done so far. And then he uh, asked me to do, offer you to ask him two questions. Uh, not more than two because we have a presentation afterwards and it would take too long. You can't ask him thousand questions. I did, so believe me. Um, just think of something you want to ask someone who worked on the original Apollo program. I will just select one randomly and uh, ask him this question. If it works. Does it good also? No. Ah, hello. Are you uh, hearing hey. me? Hello, Jack. I've been having trouble getting on the line. Ah, I see. Okay. okay. Uh, can you start your video? Yeah, how do you do that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No problem. So um, I'm just starting my video, so you can see me uh, first. It should be on any minute, yeah? Hello? And... There you are. Yeah, okay. And just in, uh, at the bottom of the Skype window, you can see this blue button that we had yesterday. And you can set a, click on it and it shows uh, start my video. So, ah, okay. It looks like... Okay, and I should type... Hello. <laughs> Ah, okay. I, I will try to hold the laptop in the regards of the audience, just to get a picture of them. Um. Yeah, that's you. Hello. Hello, man. Okay. If you want, I can hold it this way. No problem. Okay. <laughs> I guess. Okay, I'm sorry for all the uh, problems. I couldn't seem to get online this morning. Ah, no problem, no problem. Yeah, okay, now you're there and... <laughs> ah. Okay? Yeah. Can we go? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Hello. You gonna introduce me? I, I introduce you a little bit, but uh, can introduce yourself oh. if you want to, additionally. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I'm Jack Crenshaw. Uh, some of you may have read my column uh, or my tutorial on compiler theory. 
so I understand there's some interest in that. I'm a uh, columnist for Embedded Systems Programming Magazine, and I wrote a book called uh, uh, Software Toolbox for Real-Time Programmers. Uh, and the reason we're here today is because uh, I worked on Project Apollo and things even before Project Apollo uh, for NASA. Would you like to know more? <laughs> I'm going to. Yep. I'm going to take that as a yes. Uh, I, inter I was graduating from college in uh, 1959. I interviewed uh, a number of organizations, and one of them was NACA, which stands for. Uh, National Advisory Committee on Aviation. That was founded back in 1913 or something like that. Uh, so I was, you know, hoping I would get an offer from them in Langley, Virginia. Well, the offer letter came okay, okay. and it was, I wish I still had that letter. Uh, it was on NACA stationery and some secretary had crossed out the C and put an S above it. So basically, in the time that it took between the interview and the offer, NACA had been changed to NASA. Uh, I went to work there in April 59 and um, it went to Langley, Virginia. I went to the Theoretical Mechanics Division and worked with a wonderful bunch of people, very small group, uh, called the Lunar Trajectories Group. Uh, that name, I guess, tells you everything. Very small group. Uh, my boss was a fellow named Bill Michael. If you Google Bill Michael, you'll find a lot of information on him. He was involved in the debate over uh, LOR versus uh, Earth Orbit Rendezvous. Uh, you may remember Older folks may remember that. Uh, Robert Tolson was a colleague. He's also a, uh, a helper on the part-time scientist group. Uh, so I think we have a sort of a unique uh, situation in the sense that um, we have two of the original members of the uh, lunar trajectories group, which only consisted of five people. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, you've all seen the figure eight uh, trajectory uh, that's the circumlunar trajectory. It shows up everywhere, anywhere, anytime uh, someone talks about lunar missions. Uh, Bill, Michael, and I are, were two of the first four people to write a paper on that. We wrote that in 1961. Uh, I, I did a lot of studies on that using a restricted three-body program. Maybe I should pause here and just point out uh, Newtonian physics and, and Newtonian trajectories has got to be one of the purest applied math uh, uh, efforts in history because you've just got a few masses which can be treated as point masses uh, flying around each other and affected only by gravity. So it's a very clean environment. Unfortunately, the problem itself is not all that clean. If you look at the um, relationship, say for Mars orbit, uh, it's basically a two body problem, Sun and Mars, nothing else matters. Same with the uh, sun and the earth, out of the earth moon berry center. But the motion of the moon is a very complex thing because the sun uh, perturbs it um, not negligible amount. So an accurate uh, computation of the uh, earth, sun, moon system and for the throw a spacecraft in there is a four body problem and uh, there's no easy solution for that. Uh, way back in Newton's day, people like Lagrange worked on, uh, tried, they tried to 
get a um, simplified solution. And uh, they worked out the restricted three-body model, which has only the Earth and the Moon moving in a plane uh, and the trajectory of a spacecraft in the same plane. Actually, they were they were interested more in the motion of a, a comet in the solar system, but the, the math is the same. We had a restricted three-body program, and that's what I used for my studies. In 1960, I left NASA and went to work for General Electric. Basically, I followed the money. <laughs> uh, uh, General Electric had been given a contract uh, to do pre-Apollo studies, uh, basically study the whole problem of getting to the moon and back. And um, I was hired in to help with that. And uh, later on, they got there was a, a huge uh, proposal effort uh, for the production contract, which GE spent a lot of money on, worked very hard on. Unfortunately, uh, they lost to North America. And uh, there's some stories about skullduggery and the, and the government that send that contract to them, but I won't go there. Uh, we were very disappointed. In it. We did get a contract to do uh, what they called reliability assessment, which was basically how, what's the probability that the astronauts will come back alive? That was number one. And what's the probability that they will, uh, that we'll complete the mission? So we had a huge efforts to um, answer those two questions. And a, a big computer program calculating the, the things that could go wrong. I was not too involved in that part. I continued with trajectory. Uh, let me back up and say that uh, at GE, I was responsible for all of the trajectories generated for um, the Apollo program, the study contract, and all that. We used an in-body program for that effort. And uh, there was a lot of, a lot of uh, interesting stuff came out of that. You have to remember, this was 1960. Uh, computers were brand new. Uh, I think the IBM 702 was out some years before, I think it was around 1955, but nobody really had them until the Apollo effort started. Uh, there were maybe three or four IBM 702s being used for scientific uh, work before the, the Apollo effort and for NASA and uh, quite a few after because all of the contractors to NASA pretty much had to, had to buy those computers. Not cheap. Uh, now there's been a lot of talk about the, the power of these computers. Uh, needless to say, uh, an IBM 702 would, would not be a very impressive computer. Today it had 32K of RAM, uh, no disks, uh, mag tape. So it was not a fast machine, but internally they did okay. And uh, they had 36-bit um, uh, word length, double precision floating point, it's hard for floating point. Uh, you, could, uh, you could get some things done. Um, when I was at GE, we had uh, 7094s, which were a good bit faster. And later on, I went and worked for a company called Morpher Corporation. And we worked with NASA, uh, George C. Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville. And there we had uh, Univac 1108s, CDC 6600s. And those, those guys were pretty good fast in anybody's uh, measure. Uh, the 6600 had a 60-bit word length and could really zoom. It was designed, I understand, uh, by the same designer uh, 
that design super, supercomputers later. So we got a fair amount of work done. Uh, one of the things we found in the, in the business of uh, generating trajectories to the moon is it's not easy. Uh, because of the interaction uh, between the Earth, Moon, and the spacecraft, uh, near the Earth, the trajectory looks exactly like a, a, a conic section, a two-body solution. And uh, in our case, the, it's a very elongated ellipse because the perigee has to be near the Earth and the epigee has to be near the Moon. So that pretty well describes the, you know, defines the orbit that you have to fly. Uh, in the vicinity of the moon, um, it, it looks like a hyperbola, and it looks very much like a hyperbola. But there's that no man's land out between them that both bodies affect the spacecraft pretty, pretty heavily, and so uh, the solution really requires all of the bodies to be present. And then if you had uh, the sun, it's Orbit problem. I want to make a comment about why we have to add the sun, and uh, we and, and our time scientists are, are working on that right now. Uh, the sun, uh, if, if we were talking about just the perturbation of the sun, the spacecraft, it's low. The problem is that it uh, perturbs the moon as well. So if you're calculating a trajectory to the moon, and you consider the effect of the sun on the spacecraft, and you also have to consider this, the uh, effect on the moon itself. Otherwise, you get a, a situation where you're considering the acceleration of one body and not the other. Uh, the motion of the moon due to the solar perturbation is extremely complex, and uh, the Brown Hill theory involves thousands of terms in a in a uh, Fourier expansion. So we're always looking for simplifications and uh, modifications that will let us study the problem without having to generate these vectors. Uh, I will say that uh, Robert was asking me yesterday how long it took to calculate one of these trajectories. And uh, the answer is minutes, not hours, uh, maybe 20 minutes. Uh, it's not a hard problem because if, if you're using a uh, variable step runger cutter sort of integrator, it only takes a couple of hundred integration steps to get there. It's not like trying to calculate thousands of orbits of, of low Earth orbit. Uh, it's a simpler problem than that in terms of just integrating equations of motion. and. Uh, so it doesn't take great gobs of computer um, power. I've calculated lunar trajectories on IBM 1130, which was an ancient 16-bit computer. You like the, the 1130, we had 16K of RAM, that's K bytes, 16K, and a hard drive with 512K. And we were calculating lunar trajectories on that. So. Pretty interesting. Uh, now, the part where it comes in more difficult is deciding how to get there. If you consider uh, the problem, here I am in, in low Earth orbit, and I want to go to the moon, how do you do that? What, where do I start the burn uh, to go into translunar orbit? And uh, how long do I thrust? And all that other thing. Uh, you, you can, in an ordinary uh, numerical integration, we do what we call a, uh, oh, are you seeing me bounce back and forth, I guess? Uh, I'll try to be still. Uh, if you give the trajectory an initial set of initial conditions, the position and velocity relative to the Earth, you just let it run, just integrating the equations of motion, uh, you can follow it out and you arrive somewhere. But that somewhere is hardly ever at the moon. Uh, you can go through some spherical trig sorts of uh, uh, calculations and help to 
narrow down the search, but eventually you're going to have to do a search. Uh, I first went to work for GE. Uh, they had none of that stuff. They had the in-body program, very accurate uh, numerical integrator uh, that could solve motion around all the planets plus, plus the moon. Uh, but they had nothing in the way of calculating what the initial conditions should be. And their advice to me was, just run the trajectories till you get near the moon. And that's just not workable. It's, you've got six degrees of freedom, you can't just do all and error on that. Uh, so what we did was we worked out a lot of uh, spherical trig type stuff uh, to come up with the geometry that we needed, the orbit plane, uh, trajectory plane, the, the lunar orbit plane, so forth, of course, the equator, uh, and work out the geometry that would get us near the moon. Now, because of the perturbation, uh, you don't actually get there still. So you still have to do a uh, an iteration in some fashion. And uh, the, the problem when you look at it that way is called the two-point boundary value problem. And it's one of the most difficult in dynamics to work because it, it essentially involves an iteration on the initial conditions that will reach final, the final condition that you want. Uh, well, during my period at, at both at NASA and GE, um, I wrote a, quite a number of programs that would solve that. And uh, that's really sort of what I uh, claim to be my, my uh, claim is that, uh, I claim to, to uh, Jack, hello. There it is. Uh, and one thing, I am due to the time with uh, passing. I think we should do the question part now, if you feel up to it. Huh? Okay. If thanks. everything's fine. Uh, I, just, okay? I, I just wanted to say one more thing. Hmm? Yeah, okay, no is, problem, no problem. So, yeah. uh, at, at GE, I worked on one of the first, I think, to work on abort trajectories. Uh, we had a, what we call a fast return, and the circumlunar trajectory was a free return. And if any of you saw the movie uh, uh, Apollo 13, there's a conversation there where you know the uh, flight director uh, gets told that there's a problem, and he says, uh, "Can we do a fast return?" And the other guy, guy says, "No, we'll have to do a free return." And I really like that exchange because that just describes my entire work for Apollo. Okay. Um, okay. Any questions? Can I just ask anyone who wants? Yeah. Can I just ask anyone who wants to ask a question, um, just to uh, queue up and use the microphones here, um, rather than shout out because poor old Jack's not yeah. going to hear it. Go ahead. Yep. Hi. Uh, I was just curious, since you were talking about how computing power um, was so different back in the 60s compared to what it is now, um, if you are doing anything substantially different in terms of uh, planning the trajectory for this mission, um, is, there a, is there a different approach or different methods that you're using to take advantage of all of the computing power that you have now? Actually, there is a couple. Uh, the first thing is that on the Apollo missions, even if we were landing on the moon, uh, it was still a free return trajectory. Is there a problem? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the, the idea was that we leave the Earth, thing goes right, we need no mid-course corrections, our guidance has been perfect, we'll come back to the Earth, and re-enter in a satisfactory re-entry corridor. Uh, we, we did that, uh, obviously, for safety reasons, uh, even when we were planning to land on the moon. Uh, we don't have to do that uh, for the Lunar X Prize. 
Uh, we, if we miss the moon, we don't really care where it goes after that. Uh, so we can use trajectories that are a little bit different. And the key thing is uh, the trajectory uses a little less energy than, uh, than for the Apollo program. Um, we, um, um, there is some interest in returning a uh, rock sample from the moon, and the return from the moon is different also. And the reason for that is we don't have to keep astronauts alive, so we can enter in a, in, in a much steeper reentry than was possible for Apollo. As far as the, the tools, there's not that much difference. Um, I'd, I'll just emphasize again, uh, we had to pretty much invent techniques on the fly uh, because the computers were so new. But the uh, programs we got finally were pretty much the same ones we use today. That's Any more questions? Hmm? Yes, no? If you've got any more questions, now's the time. Just come up, use the mic. <laughs> wow, stunned. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we have a taker. Uh, hello. Uh, I was wondering, since there is no astronauts involved this time, is there some simplification you can do to the orbit, the trajectory, so that you don't have to have all the variables for a four-body problem? Or is there some simplification, or is the sun always involved, however you do it? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because there are quite a number of simplifications. The easiest one is just to, to uh, execute a uh, two-body orbit. If you think about it, uh, the perigee of, of, of ellipse needs to be near the Earth. The apogee needs to be, it, it has to at least reach the orbit of the Moon. So if you design a, a, uh, an elliptical orbit, that eccentricity, uh, if you time it right, you'll, you'll find that you do get, hit the moon. Uh, it's a lot easier when we're just trying to hit it as opposed to swing back. Uh, also, there's some techniques that we worked out. There's a thing called patch conic. Uh, you might be familiar with that. Uh, sometimes it's called uh, matched conic. Uh, it's used a lot for interplanetary missions. There's a what they call a sphere of influence around the moon. And if you make the assumption, simply an assumption that outside that sphere of influence, the most really body relative to the Earth, inside it's two body relative to the moon, then uh, you can get you can't get accurate uh, uh, trajectories, but you can uh, get very nice uh, motions that you can use for parametric studies, that kind of thing. There's an even more interesting one, which uh, I think I invented. Now, you never know about these things, but it's, it's based on a very simple principle. Uh, because this orbit is almost uh, parabolic, the energy turns out to be dependent only on angular momentum. Uh, so if you leave the vicinity of the moon at the right angular momentum, which of course translates to a velocity relative to the Earth, then you're going to re-enter at the desired altitude. And I'll mention that in Apollo 13, remember uh, they had to do uh, manual burns, manual uh, mid-course corrections to hit the uh, re-entry card. Uh, that's how that was done. It was done strictly by matching the uh, angular momentum that they needed. Next. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. 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 Bye bye. Bye bye.
Uh, okay, I'm not sure about the schedule. Um, as I thought, we've got one part left in regards of the communications. Is this okay? I think it's 15 minutes, should be fine. No? Okay. And I'm pretty sure you will like this part. Whew. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see if this works again. Oh, no, the mouse. Yeah, okay, special guest. Stop. Hmm? 45 is, is absolutely perfect. I just need 15. Hmm? Okay, okay, okay. That's okay, fine. Perfect. Okay. As you can see right there, and now for something completely different. So just get rid of trajectories and Google and XPies for first. And let's think about communication and how to do it uh, a better way right now. So first of all, as we've developed a solution, I would like to start with the problem. So what is the problem? Because if you don't have a problem, why develop a solution? It's because it's quite boring. <laughs> So, okay, first of all, we have space. Well, space is always, it's big, it's well, really big. <laughs> it's cold and most important, it's empty. It's not 100% empty, but you've got a, re a giant distance between stars, between, even between planets. So, here we are, starting with our problem. Our first problem is distance. So just give you four examples. The first one we already know about is the distance between Earth and Moon. It's about 400 kilometers. That's fine, we've already heard that. Okay, so let's look at the distance between Earth and Mars. That's about 130 million kilometers. It's an average value because Mars has a relative distinct rotation, uh, rotationally distance fluctuations between Earth. There's a wonderful graphic on Wikipedia on this. And this is pretty cool. This is the distance between Earth and the farthest ever uh, uh, man-built object away from Earth still communicating with us. And it's 60.9 billion kilometers, if I'm correct. Yes, it's Voyager 1. It's pretty cool. Okay, so why I'm telling you this? Because with distance, always there's a problem. The problem is not just mathematics, because I'm not so much into mathematics. So. I try to explain you this equation a little bit with some graphics. So let's look at this. We have our uh, Earth, everyone knows it. We have the geostationary orbit. On the geostationary orbit, we have all the satellites you can communicate with to do the important things like watching DVBS HDTV all day. So communicating with this satellite is absolutely no problem. You can do watch HD television, no problem. Okay. So let's look at something like this example. If we place this sending unit from the geostationary orbit in the orbit of the moon, you will see that you need a 100 times more signal strength to get the same signal back to Earth. So just to show you what this equation means, you can see if you look at the distance, because it's factor 10, you can see that's uh, 1 divided by r um, power of 2. So we see our equation works out. So what does this mean? This extreme high factor, 100. Okay, let's look at the next line. You will see. Yeah. Okay. And greater distance between two objects always leads to the fact that you need larger sending and receiving antennas. The interesting part of that is it's not everyone thinks about antennas like the very large array in New Mexico. We have this very big high gain antennas, 30 diameter and 15 pieces of it sorted like an X in the middle in the desert. So this is a big antennas. But if you read this sentence, you see you have to uh, size the sending antenna too. So if you need a high bandwidth, the, your craft, which is moving into space, always needs a larger, larger, larger and more powerful and more energy-based antenna to transmit the same amount of data that it was transmitting by half the distance. So this is something you have to keep in mind because energy is something you don't have in a spacecraft. Um, the best energy option you have in a spacecraft is a radiotopic isotopic generator. It's called RTG. Most people say, hey, use solar panels. Solar panels are great, but they have some problems, some very side effects. First of all, um, sometimes you don't have direct sunlight, but that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that solar panels sometimes they have a limited lifetime. 
let's say about 30 years and sell burnt out. They are not producing the same amount of energy they produce in the first year. Solar panels have a distinct lifetime. Normally, the uh, energy output starts increasing, and suddenly, um, after one or two years, it starts uh, increasing and then starts decreasing of a defined lifetime. So, RTG batteries have mostly a lifetime of, let's say, 200 years or so, which is quite enough. But, as said before, you don't have this in a normal spacecraft. You can't simply go to a supermarket or so and buy an RTG battery because it's based on radioisotopic radio material. You don't, simply don't get it, as a, the material itself. So, what does this mean? So, if you don't scale the sending side and the energy side accordingly, you always end up with a smaller bandwidth the further you go away. So, we'll give you some examples about bandwidth. It's quite interesting with the latest Mars missions. But let's look at the second side. There's two sides of this problem. The second side is availability. Availability can mean a lot, so I am just to have prepared the following slide. The slide, you can see every object in our universe is rota rotating around its own axis, and some objects like the Moon are even rotating around other planets, and at all they are rotating around the Sun. So, you can see yeah, all these trajectories right here. Okay, we have trajectories again. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's take a look at, for, for example, so we have a craft right here. I've just sent up a spacecraft and it's traveling around Mars. I don't know why, but it's right there in this moment. So, and now I want to send some data to my spacecraft. Let's do a kernel update or something like this. So, but you can easily see the problem. In this point, you see, the spacecraft is not, um, let's say, human eye visible to Earth. So, in regards of radio communications, you don't always need uh, visual uh, seeing. You don't even need a visual line of sight. This is what I want. Um, but, in this case, Mars is simply so big that it blocks all communication signals. So, you would have to wait for a window something like this, huh? where your craft is somewhere here. May do, maybe doing a Lagrange transaction, and you can see, hey, cool, I got direct line of sight to Earth. So now I can sit down in my uh, backyard in Berlin and do a kernel update. Really? Let's see at this. So, let's look at our example. I've implemented some nice viewports for you. So, for example, I'm sitting in Berlin, want to do my kernel update. So, but my spacecraft, it's now it's this side of the viewport, it's surrounding the moon. We have a problem. The moon, where my spacecraft on the surface, is facing northern and southern American part of Earth. So, the only antenna available listening to this communication and may be able to upload and download data may be uh, the VLA or some other antennas placed around the USA. So, let's introduce a new object in this is. So, everyone is talking about CubeSats right now. I don't know why, but most people are quite interested in them, so I introduced one. So, okay, some university launched a CubeSat, want to do a kernel update too. I don't know why, but I want to do it. And this university has a deal with um, NASA and want to use the VLA. This is quite a normal thing. Most uh, universities and non-profit organizations use things like SETI or the Very Large Array in New Mexico to transmit and receive data. But look at this. If you see the, traject uh, the trajectory of the CubeSat moving around the Earth, you see that it just has passed the VLA. So it takes a distinct amount of time, depending on the rotational speed of the CubeSat, to return into its communication window. So right now, for example, I would have to wait 24 hours to get my communication link back. This is something that's pretty not cool in regards of nowadays communication. So there are some, some solutions already to this, but these solutions aren't quite fit. But I will tell you about something more about this. Okay. So you see the problem with availability. You don't always have an antenna just in the shot. So, okay, let's come to the solution part. Um, okay. What do we need to build a, a solution for this problem? For this problem of distance and availability. First of all, we stick to an FPGA hardware. This is some component we really like. We use it in all our electronics, and this is one of the reasons why we've partnered with Silinx. And 
what is the reason why we choose an FPGA as a control unit? FPGA can do great things. I'm sure some of you on this, uh, are radio amateurs here in the audience. So they will know what it means to do frequency shifting. You have it on your VLAN adapter does it all the time. An FPGA is, uh, can do frequency shifting in hardware. An FPGA, you have to imagine that an FPGA is a chip itself which emulates an entire printed circuit board. So you can reroute it on the fly. You, have a, um, you can do, change everything you want in regards of the frequency and sub-frequencies. So, FPGAs have so-called IP cores. Arne told you about it. IP cores are highly optimized subroutines which allow you to do very fast transactions that you couldn't do on a normal computer system. Things like stream modulation, doing on your normal PC would simply knock out the entire system and you had 99% CPU usage and you couldn't use the system for anything else. Doing it with an FPGA just use about, let's say, 5 or 3% of the entire system resources and the system can still do a dozen of other things. So, FPGAs are really suited for distributed tasks in this regard. Okay, and most important, uh, it's all, I don't know any FPGA <laughs> featuring a Windows system, so all FPGAs are based on GNU Linux system. So, why is this important? This is important because you got the GNU tool chain with all demons you need. This includes all the IP protocols and network layers. You will see why we need network layers in this regard. So, and you need our satellite dish. But most of you think, okay, I want to communicate with something in orbit around Moon. So you're thinking, okay, I need this large high gain antenna, 30 diameter long, and I put it on my rooftop. Okay, nobody has a rooftop that could hold that big antenna. So why not try to do this with a standard size antenna? The standard size antenna you can buy, the largest one, would be about 90 centimeters in diameter. This is a standard size antenna. If you buy it in China, you can get it for 10 euro. It's pretty cheap. It's not like the things you pay if you go to a normal uh, media store. So, okay, we've got our standard dish. Now, no, standard dish is just made to receive uh, satellite TV. So, we have to do some slight modifications for it, but you can easily find it through Google, and it's quite easy if you ask someone who is from the radio amateur section. So, you can do sending and receiving with the satellite dish. But, and this is very important, exclusively in Germany, you have to always make sure that your, everything you do is compliant with the amateur radio regulations. Because if you do not, you can get arrested for it. Okay, so we've got these two parts, and now let's see what we can make out of it. So, this um, picture is pretty full of a lot of stuff, so I will start explaining it all separately. Let's start again. Do you see a lot of blue points? What is this? I don't know. Earth is not sick or something like this. And, okay, let's start. The blue points are so called, as we call it, link stations. A link station is simply both components bound together. We got a FPGA lined up with a satellite dish and some additional component to uh, do the frequency controlling. It's just some electronics around it. So all this together it gives a tiny black box that is mounted on the surface, uh, or the back surface of the um, parabolic antenna. And the parabolic antenna itself is featured on a steering motor, so it can be rotated in any direction. There are a lot of details in this regard, so if you're interested in getting details about this link station, just talk to me outside after the presentation. Um, so just keep it simple. So this link station has a Linux system running, has a satellite dish attached, can shift any frequency at once, and can send and receive data. And the, one additional thing, it's connected to the internet. So, some of you already imagine what you can do with something like this. So, first of all, you say, oh my god, this costs a lot of money. No, it doesn't. If you think about FPGA hardware, we, we already um, built prototypes in this regard. We're talking about less than 1,000 euros for one unit. So, it's definitely easy to deploy because it's not very uh, expensive. Um, I will tell you a little bit about our current prototyping status after we do it for this uh, slide. Okay, so we have connected all these dots in the internet, so let's connect them to a central gateway. For our sake of simplicity, I say just a central gateway is uh, sitting here somewhere in Germany. Okay, and all systems are connected via the internet to this gateway. So now, um, 
we have our uh, surface probe on the moon and we want to communicate with it. So, to communicate with the moon, you need a relatively large antenna with, let's say, at least 15 meters in diameter. But you only have 90 centimeters in diameter. How can you do this? So this is simple. As due to the capability of frequency shifting, you can take a big frequency, divide it by, let's say, 500 megahertz, separate it on multiple link stations, in this case, let's say 15 or so, put them in a so-called pool. You all know cloud computing. I think most of you do. It's, it's exactly the same subject. You combine them and you have, um, let's say, communication cloud. I always call it link pool. And this pool just receives segmentated the frequency with at least one load ac acting as a backup link. So, what do we have right now? If you um, take the laws of physics, calculating the spectrum and the band you've got here with this uh, combined antennas, you end up with an antenna which is even larger than a 30 diameter antenna that you have in the AGA at the very large array in uh, New Mexico. So, this is something pretty cool. So, you get a very big antenna distributed in this example across America. And it's just very small on a rooftop, on a building, and you can't even see the difference to a normal satellite dish. Now, maybe you can, but it's not uh, the original intention. So, okay, now we have to recall the fact everything is moving, and it's moving pretty fast in regards of mass very fast. So, we have the problem mass is really hunting down over the earth with all these communication windows. So, one good thing about this approach is you're using the same effect that you have when you cloud computing using about distributed computing power. You have an always standby backup units right in the spot like this one. So if you imagine that mass is moving this side, then this unit is already um, turning around to mass, setting everything up, pulling into the frequencies, and if this one goes out, it takes over. So you end up with a, and this is very interesting, just go to the next slide and we can go back again. This. This is something that really took a lot of work, but it looks quite easy. Um, you've got a lot of numbers in here. So we did uh, some number crunching as we started building our prototypes to see what we've come up with with this system. So, if you do one single link station, one single link station with a 90 centi diameter antenna um, could be transmitting more than 50 megabits up and down speed to a satellite in a geostationary orbit. And now comes the interesting part. Did you know it's 6, 30, 000, 60, oh God, 30, 000, 6, kilometers away from Earth? And the most important thing, it's 24-7. Why is it 24-7? So, as you see, all are 24-7. Um, our goal is to be placed at least around 100 nodes around Earth. It may sound a lot, but if you think about it, 100 nodes, it would just mean about f uh, two or three nodes in Germany, and it's quite easy to find someone who just takes a satellite dish in his uh, backyard, plugs it into the internet, and it's okay. So, it's not quite um, to name something about this, the energy consumption of the entire system, it does not exceed more than 100 watt. So, your computer does use more energy than one of the stations. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I want to explain why it's 24-7. Just go back. As you see, uh, there's a large number of stations and this, uh, with uh, rotating principles of the pools, you can see that there's almost an ultimate available link pool on every side of the Earth. So, if Mars is rotating around Earth, the link pool is always following Mars. Or, well, more precisely, it's beforehand there, so Mars can just get into the spot, communication can happen, and so on. So it's really is complicated, the, the technology behind this, because you have to do, uh, recalculate all the data packets, because you receive them at different times, different times, you have the delays in internet, and so on. But we have uh, protocols and ways found to deal with this, so if you need more details in this regard, just ask me. Um, okay. So. Back to our number sheet. So, one interesting thing for our team, as we are a uh, team participating in the Google Linux Prize, is this one thing. This is quite normal. We are um, communicating with planets. Yeah, great, okay. But communicating with an object on the surface is something completely different. So, we have here 
the moon cast. This means our rover is standing on the surface of the moon and we want to transmit data. Our rover has a relatively low energy budget. Current estimations are about, let's say, 60 watt at best. So if you have noon at uh, moon day, you have 60 watt due to the solar energy, not more. Normally, let's calculate with 40 watt. 20 watt is the total energy available at best for the antenna. As you uh, saw on Arne's presentation, the antenna and communication system is one combined unit. This is something really special. It's a uh, self-developed technology in this regard. So, and we have calculated that we can use only, f we need 15 link stations, 15, that's an important number in this regard, to get 50 mbits, megabits down speed, and most important, 500 kilobits megabit up speed, and again, 24-7. This may not be that much that you've got when you consider your uh, VDSL anschluss or uh, connection or something like this, but it is enough to fulfill the requirements set by the Mooncast, and that's very important. Okay, okay, and then let's look at these examples. So if you see Earth to the Moon, Earth to the Moon is quite easy again. It's like the uh, geostationary orbit because the distance isn't that big because 40,000, 400,000, Okay, there is a difference, but it's not that much compared to this number. <laughs> and if you look at Earth, uh, it's again 50 megabits, but not more, definitely not more. And this is very important. The system, if you calculate 100 link stations on the entire Earth, facing at least half of them to the object you are communicating with, you could end up with a bandwidth from Earth to Mars with 5 megabits by a distance of 130 million kilometers. So why is this important? Currently, um, NASA has uh, some Mars exploration missions going on, and if I am correctly, they are currently using only about 50 kilobits of their, away, uh, of their bandwidth to communicate downstream data with Earth. They could use about more, about, let's say, one megabit, but uh, not more currently. That's had to do with the technology they've embedded in their, on their sending side at the probes. So our goal is to have lower energy requirements on the sending part, so in deep space, but have to larger antennas, virtual antennas, not real ones, because real antennas have limitations. You can't build a 60 diameter antenna. Okay, you can, but you don't have the place for this, and you have to build it all over the surface. Uh, so distributing the antenna as a virtual antenna grid around Earth is a quite great, great option. So you got Earth as one big antenna. Oh just <laughs> have to imagine this. Um, okay, so one thing to note about this is um, we already have this problem a lot uh, in regards of space communication. For example, with the Apollo moon landing, NASA sent out uh, chips for the coasts to extend the communication window with the crew on the um, lunar surface to get a full-time video sequence. Otherwise, they had to wait at length, it was four hours to get the next communication window. But they wanted to do a live streaming of this. So they had to manually extend with chips their communication grid. They do pretty much, not pretty much the same in terms of technology, but of the idea. Yeah, this is uh, currently a project we're working on. We've already have developed some prototypes in this regard, and this is very important about this. We're not talking about a simple idea. We have uh, partnered with two companies in this regard, which I can't name right now, sorry. And they've agreed to allow us to place more than 100 stations. So they are giving us place at their grounds to place the stations where we have internet and the needed maintenance, because if something like a tsunami comes and your dish gets got uh, rolled over, someone has to pull it up and check it again. So we always need a technician in place. Not all time, but sometimes once a year or so. Yeah, and this is, let's say, our biggest side project for 2010. We want to start with a small node network, like let's say 15 nodes, and see how this works out. Yeah. One thing about this that should be interesting for all of you, due to patent and other things like this, Everything we do here will be licensed as Creative Commons completely. So this technology will be available to everyone because the only way something like this can work is everyone could participate in this. So everyone can decide, I want to put a link station in my garden and want to get a bandwidth share of this network. 
So you can pull the internet from Earth into space. And this enables to do something pretty cool things in future. So just have to lay the ground for it right now. Yeah, I have to say that's pretty much it. <laughs> because I haven't prepared an ending slide for this. I just <laughs> thought about it. Um, um, is there time for questions or not? Yeah. Oh, so, okay. Um, hmm? Until three. Until three. Oh, okay. Twenty minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you've got um, We've got like twenty minutes for questions. Um, one half thing I have to say about this: that I'm just the one who presenting this idea. The development behind this uh, was been done by persons in our teams, by this uh, well, by these forty-three team members I mentioned before. So I can't answer all questions. I can mention most of them. So if you want, ask. If you need some details or so, I could show you them afterwards on my laptop. I've got a lot of technical data and stuff and yeah. images like this. So if anyone has questions, can uh, they just go up to the mics and uh, just uh, go for it? Even to other topics we had before, like the rover or so. Yep, rover, um, you know, the, uh, the communication side, the, the whole thing. Uh, go for it. Come on, you've got questions. Otherwise, we will be um, at our booth till 8 p.m. today. So no problem, no hurry in this regard. All right, I have a question. OK, absolutely. Shoot it. So if I wanted to, say, borrow some nodes to create an enormous uh, uh, radio telescope, hmm? um, kind of like uh, presumably that, that could be done at some later date. It uh, depends on how you build up the network in regards of management, not in regards of technology. In technology, it's all dumped nodes connected yeah. together, and you say, you do this, and you do this. Um, one idea to do the management, right now all nodes are built up by us ourselves, mm -hmm. but if we start incorporating different nodes, uh, one thing I didn't mention, the concept itself is completely built to incorporate existing high-gain antennas completely. No problem. You could connect the VLA to this network, no problem. This is so completely the entire all protocols are developed for this especially. Okay, um, and to uh, conclude in this, I think the most fairest approach would be to give everyone a share according to the link stations he donated to the network. For example, if someone is providing hosting space for 15 link stations, he could get a link pool of 15 stations. And the stations aren't fixed. Mars is not communicating with station 21, 23, 24, 25. It's, t it's communicating with 10 stations. Don't matter which one is what, because they are rotating. So, so yeah, you get a number and yeah, you're just borrowing it, so for example. But you have to provide something for this. So I think it right. sounds like a good approach. Yeah. <laughs> my, my inner astronomer. I, I did astronomy. Uh, I, I did astronomy and space science at, at university, so this is hmm? fascinating. Okay, we have some questions. Go ahead, guys. Hit it. Um, quick question. Uh, you probably need to synchronize all these stations in some way so they can transmit the, their data at the right time. How yeah. exactly do you synchronize them and what precision do you need to have them synchronized? Um, that's quite a complicated topic. Um, let's do it the other way around. Uh, synchronizing them on the receiving side is a lot easier to explain for everyone. So yeah. if we receive data packets from, let's say, from the moon, and you received them distributed yeah, on, on okay, you take this big Which, this one, part this again. All, all so there. every station has a so uh, GPS receiver. The GPS receiver is equipped with, um, to get the uh, current position and to get a relatively exact time. So every package that is received is uh, packed up into, let's say, two megabyte chunks and stamped with a timestamp. This timestamp will be transmitted to the server and the server will be able um, with already tested this, the timestamp provided by the GPS network is uh, detailed enough to do what we want to do. So it's a little complicated to explain in this regard. But um, all packets are timestamped and with the timestamps they can be reorganized so they are a fully stream at the end of data. So your source for the timing is actually a GPS receiver, not, uh, you're not using NTP for example or something like that, you're just using an NTP receiver. Something. Sorry, I have to say that I didn't understand this correctly, acoustically. Sorry. Uh, no problem. Uh, 
So you're using a GPS receiver to uh, for your timing source. You're not using any to get the time internet. code. Yes, uh -huh, to get the timing. Hmm? Thank you. No problem. Um, hello. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> uh, did I understand correctly that you are already past the, the prototype stage? You've already got quite a few uh, link stations deployed and. Uh, becoming more and more stations and uh um, yeah we've just um, we've just uh, done a lot no more than one year about just about the theory work with this mm -hmm. because the theory behind this is very complicated all the formulas and we started uh, developing our prototype link stations and we've showed it to some companies where we know they could be interested not in buying them but in helping us building a test network mm -hmm. we are talking about okay the prototyping network we are building up will be using uh, amateur radio frequency only. This does do some severe limitations on this because it's not allowed to transmit encrypted data on amateur radio frequencies. This is something that's quite clear right now. So um, in the first prototype network, you can only do what you are allowed to do as an amateur radio specialist. Yes. And what's the time frame to get uh, the first real space communication up? Uh, it's uh, where for me, and we don't have the X prize at the next month or so. <laughs> but as we are doing the X prize besides this, I think my personal goal is to by the end of next year. Okay. Maybe we can do a follow up presentation on our progress if you're interested. Thank you. Yeah, I have two questions. The first question um, is to your economical um, situation. You said you. Um, you just need 15 million euros to build this. Ah. Uh, that's what I mean. Yeah, you're referring <laughs> to the first presentation. Where yeah, to, to, yeah okay. to, to your first presentation. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I wonder, um, does this calculation include salary for people, like enge engineering costs, or is it just the cost for the material? Yeah, I know what you mean. You mean the, uh, paying for the manpower we use. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just look at our name, part-time scientists. Yeah. I think it just answers it. Not yeah, that I, I want to yeah. answer it anymore, but it just says it. We're doing it in our free time. Mm -hmm. And I personally have the opinion that people who work on something in their free time are much more motivated than they were in their normal work day. I, so totally, I totally agree. <laughs> Definitely. But, but I guess this is also the reason why you only need 15 uh, million no. and not just uh, No, no, not really. Uh, we've calculated all the manpower cost in our regard with a relatively small team. I think about, about 50 people and we came up with about 3 million. It's, uh, so it's not that much. We should have 3 million, but it's compared to numbers like uh, 60 billion or so, you see, yes. it's quite a small amount in this regard. Okay. It's, it's just one thing. We are not going to um, buy a new room, set in 50 people, and let's do some talkings for a year, just be getting to work. It's all we really want to do. Okay, the second um, small question is, um, all this stuff you send up in space, hmm? all this materials usually needs to be certified or yeah. Um, yeah, like tested for, for space engineering. Do you use this material only, or um, is it easy to get access to this kind of material? Yeah, that, that is a very good question. Okay, um, for our rover prototype development, we try to use as much as high wheel certified components as possible. But to do this with a rover prototype, it's really expensive. But now comes the interesting part. As we have uh, Texas Instruments as our partners, we are getting a lot of high wheel certified components from them for free. So all our electronic devices are, let's say, not certified for high wheel, but they should be. So if I should try to certify them, they could pass. So this is our goal. <laughs> We're always building them in a way, not the current prototype. This is, um, I have to say, but um, all intended prototypes always feature most high wheel components only. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, in future, it, uh, it will be only high wheel certified components, yes. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask, with the many distributed link stations you have, mm -hmm. um, how do you get around the problem of differing quality between links, say, because of different types of hardware or because of weather effects? Um, I think you're talking about the issue with the ionization of atmosphere? Uh, that, but with many different link stations, they won't all have the same quality. So no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, okay, this is something you have to always keep in, like in cloud computing systems, you always have to keep in backups. You can't say, okay, I just need 
three stations to com do communications, so you're just associating six stations or five with it. So if you have the problem with ionization of atmosphere, that's why I talked about it, because someday um, at noon, if you have a, um, in summer, you can get a problem that the, I um, the ionosphere is so much ionized that you can't get a signal through, even you're seeing the object right in front of you. I'm not an expert, so I just can't tell you what I've learned in this regard. So, okay, um, and in this case, another station which has a better receiving capability could simply take over. Anyway, as we are using backup stations, we always have two signals, so we can do some correlation or say, okay, we're using this signal because it's stronger and this is ignored. Thank you. And you have the problem, so, no, I don't want that to go, but um, we have, always have the problem of fluctuation in the internet speed. We have to keep in account this, so this is why the reason you always need backup stations. So, uh, first question, do you uh, plan to use a backup engine on the, on the lunar lander or just one? Um, I'm not sure if I can answer this 100%. This is more a question about for our aerospace sub-team. Uh, okay. I think it would be better you ask them outside because okay. the engine for the lander is, as I said before, it's not just a secret because of contracts, but it's uh, very complicated and I don't, definitely don't understand all the equations in this regard. So just ask them, they are pretty much open to this. Okay, okay? and uh, second question, do you have any energy left on the rover to do some kind of thermal control actively? Or only a passive. Ah, okay, I see you mean thermal control, yeah. Um, right now the design aims to be immune against uh, thermal problems. So it's not a good thing to do cooling all time and heating at night and so on. You can only do this if you have a radioisotopic generator. This is what NASA do all the time. They're putting in radioisotopic generators. Radioisotopic generators are pretty much, produce pretty much heat. So at the, at the night you have the heat from the generator and that day you have the problem, you have to pull out the generator because the heat gets overheating. So we are not using um, countermeasures against the temperature, we're just building everything to withstand it right now in the design. I can't for 100% tell if the final version would have some way of cooling system. But right now we discarded this concept. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have a question um, concerning the testing process um, of those link stations. So let's oh. assume you have hundreds of link stations in place, maybe mm -hmm. in two months or so, um, <laughs> on Earth. So that isn't a problem, but mm -hmm. um, you don't have a sender on Moon. And as far as I understood your concept, you don't plan to uh, trash <laughs> some lunar landers uh, just to bring a sender to the Moon and uh, test your uh, link stations in the field. So how yeah, do no you plan to do this? <coughs> I'm seeing what you mean. Uh, there are two parts of this. The first, oh, it's gone black. Flat battery. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, Swipe your finger. Uh, okay. Um, just get what I want to say. Um, da, 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 da. Sorry. Um, Mm -hmm. um, the testing process with, uh, you, you have uh, the receivers here, the link stations, but no sender on the moon. Yeah, uh, okay, I see. Yeah, um, okay, first uh, things. Uh, in the prototyping network, due to licensing, we can only use the amateur radio frequency, which limits to some parts of the X band in this regard. So, um, to say this, uh, the, there are a lot of components out there from AMSATs, for example, which are transmitting on this frequency, which you could receive with this network, for example. So it's not like there's nothing out there which is transmitting on this band. You can use them. Um, in a final version, it would be good to have a licensed band for band, your, oh, your own band for this network. It would be the best solution, but licensing a band, it's, I don't know how much it costs, but I can only guess it's multiple millions of dollars to get your own band license for. Uh, I'm not an expert, so I only read about it. It's very, very expensive. So. Yes, with the prototyping network you can receive everything that's uh, working on this amateur frequency and that's are a lot of components because AMSAT was yeah, working pretty hard to get a lot of stuff up there in the recent years. Okay, so you're basically using uh, junk that's up there and sending uh, something to... Just uh, to show if yeah. it works, yes. But okay. uh, in the end it would be good. We want to offer all Google Lunar X Prize teams. It's not just that's why one of the reasons why we do say it we do Creative Commons. Other Google Lunar X Prize teams could use this network too. So it just provides a solution not just for our team but for, uh, for other teams too and for other people who are in the need for something like this. Because one thing I have to tell you, um, 
for example, I'm the team leader of the part-time scientists. If I want to communicate with my craft on the moon, because imagine it had landed right now, okay, and I want to show you some live feed from it, I would have to contact um, um, NASA. No, not NASA correctly. It's an agency from SETI and sub-agency. I would have to contact them three months before to get a communication window of two hours. That's flexibility. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, thanks. Early on for one of the uh, X prizes, it was mentioned that there uh, would uh, need to be a 100 to 150 gram uh, payload. Hmm? Uh, any idea what kind of payload this could be? Is it su supplied or is it from uh, the It is team? supplied by the Google Lunar X Prize Foundation. They have a website where you can, um, I don't know if I read it correctly, you can, as a person, buy part of the payload the team's having. So you can say, okay, I have this very important thing and want to send it up there, so I pay you five million. And the X Prize Foundation gets this five million and gives us or the team which is transmitting this item a fair share of it. I but I don't know what equipment is exactly. It's not defined. It will be defined by the end of 2011. Uh, sorry. Okay, so it's <coughs> not some dead weight dress. <laughs> so, sorry. Well, I've got two questions. The hmm? first is about the bandwidth. You mentioned that m multiple receivers on Earth are there and located and share a 500 megahertz band. And the synchronization, is it done live or do you do it afterwards? Ah, I see. Uh, it depends pretty much on the, as I said, we have, would need a central gateway server. And this central gateway server really needs a lot of processing power. We are not talking about renting a server at one to one or something like a gaming server. We are talking about something like an IBM Excel uh, rack or something like this. So you need really need to processing power to combine all this data. Then you could do it live, yes. But otherwise you would do have to do a little bit delay in this, yeah. Uh, there w would also be uh, the problem of getting the data to the central gateway servers. So yeah, in, in regard of bandwidth, yes. If you have a data center, like if you want to host it at one-to-one -one again, uh, just an example, and one-to-one uh, -one I'm think the biggest bandwidth they're hosting is one gigabit per server. So yes, imagine if you got uh, 50 link stations connected to this server, it's just up to limits. Except if you are working with load balancing systems, but it's more a network administrator related topic. Well, thanks. Do we have any more questions? We've still got like five minutes, or we can break five minutes early for lunch. No? Nothing else? Okay, so um, thank you very much. Uh, well, you all sound rather full-time scientists to me. So, uh, thank you very much to the part-time scientists, uh, and uh, I wish you all the very best. I think everyone actually wishes you the very best of, of luck. Don't blow up on the launch pad with your borrowed rocket. Thank you. You know, uh, I... Please, please tell me. Please tell me the whole thing is insured and there's actually two of them. Hmm? Please tell me the whole thing is insured and there's actually more than one of your rovers and devices. So if you blow up on the launch pad, you can have another go. Ah, I see. Um, yeah, we always, um, as I'm personally, I'm in business terms, I'm a network administrator, so I'm more into clustering systems. That's, that is the reason why we're having three items of everything. <laughs> I never do it once. No, never, ever. Imagine it would break, so if you have three items. For example, I know that the DLR has, I know, I know it's a rule, but I know that some missions had about 15 backup items. It's pretty cool. <laughs>